Okay, I think uh, I think we can start now. So uh, welcome everyone. This event uh, was organized by Dharma Realm Buddhist University, and uh, we're very happy that you could join us. Uh, I'm just going to go through uh, a little bit of the housekeeping real quick. Uh, so the event is being recorded and also live streamed on YouTube. So just for you to be aware of that. Um, uh, also, we so this is uh, meant a little bit as a conversation, uh, right? It's not really a, like a conference or a lecture. So we do encourage people to turn their cameras on if they feel comfortable doing so, because that adds to the sort of atmosphere of uh, being able to see people's faces and so on. Of course, only if you're comfortable. Uh, also, if you want to put in the chat, uh, maybe where you're, uh, where you're tuning in from, that would be very nice. So we can see where people are joining us from. That's always uh, very interesting. Uh, and so the overview of the event is that we are going to uh, start by asking Doug a couple of questions uh, regarding this topic about uh, AI and then have a little uh, back and forth with him. So Brenda is gonna start and then uh, myself, uh, we're gonna kind of uh, ask him a, a couple of questions that are meaningful to us to kind of get the conversation started and see what he has to say. But then uh, after that, uh, we're, we're gonna open it up uh, for people to post their questions on the chat. So, uh, I'm sure many of you have already thoughts about this topic. So whatever you want to uh, post in the chat after we are done with the, with the first two questions, you can post it in the chat and then we'll uh, ask them to Doug. We cannot have people unmuting just because of the format of the event. So just post them on the chat or just send them to either uh, Brenda or myself, and then we'll ask uh, the questions to Doug. Uh, Okay, so I think that's that's uh, that's it for the housekeeping, and for the actual event. So just as a very brief introduction, uh, I think that we we wanted to do an event on AI, basically prompted by the recent release of a few uh, systems that have been very widely publicized. Uh, I'm sure most of you have already read about it or heard about it, but just uh, just very quickly. Uh, OpenAI just released uh, a system called uh, ChatGTP, which is uh, a chatbot that is, it was like a quantum leap in terms of, uh, in terms of what it could do uh, with regards to previous, uh, previous uh, artificial intelligence or chat systems that were available to the public. So it, it basically, it's a large language model. So it's been trained on a huge uh, number of data. And it's, it basically uh, has at least the appearance of intelligence. So you can have an actual conversation with it and it will respond to you and it will uh, even create, uh, it can create uh, original content. So this has just raised a whole uh, number of questions you know, about how fast this technology is evolving and all the effects it's going to have on the society and how people interact with technology and how people interact with each other, you know? So it's, uh, I'm sure uh, most of you are aware, but it's been a kind of a huge conversation that's just uh, gotten started. So we, we decided that this is a very, uh, very interesting uh, event we could do because uh, we think that although there's been a, a very, a uh, large amount of articles written and podcasts uh, recorded and so on. Uh, we believe that perhaps Buddhism has a, a unique uh, contribution to make to this conversation. So that was our interest. We wanted to see uh, what, what does the Buddhist philosophy of mind and approach to the human experience have to say about something like this? So that was kind of our question for the event. And uh, uh, as, a, as another announcement, after this event, uh, for those of you who would like to go deeper, we're going to have a follow-up event that's going to be perhaps a bit smaller uh, to kind of, uh, we want to, our idea was this, that this was sort of, uh, the first event was meant to open the conversation. 
And then we want to have a follow-up event where we have a way for people to actually engage in some kind of practical, practical exercise. So people, because uh, in Buddhism, we talk about, oh, it's not just the theory, but it's the spiritual practice aspect of it. So we wanted to have a way of people uh, to engage with the, the things we're going to be talking in the discussion more than just listening to it in, a, in an event. So for those of you who are interested, we're going to be sending out a form uh, as a follow-up email to the event. And just feel free to sign up uh, if you want to take part in this further event. And we'll, we'll send out the details uh, in that uh, email. So just, just uh, so you're aware of it. Okay, so just not to take uh, up any more time. Uh, Brenda, I think you can you can start with the first question to Doc. Take mm -hmm. it away. Thanks, Omar. Um, yeah, so we thought that a really great way to ground this conversation is to have some short sort of shared language or something we're all looking at. And a really great way to do things like that over Zoom is to look at a video. So I have a clip that I chose from this somewhat recent TV show called Westworld. Some of you may have seen it. It was based on a film from the 1970s. Um, so just a little recap for those of you who don't know the premise of the show. It's about this Wild West themed amusement park full of extremely human-like AI ro robots, which they call hosts. And then these human guests, were, they're able to go and indulge in their wildest fantasies without any real consequences. Um, and it's a really great way to now approach the more and more human-like AI that we're um, getting exposed to and interacting with. Uh, so in this scene, Dr. Ford, who's the creator of this amusement park, he's talking to one of these AI robots or hosts who's named Bernard. And Bernard has been working as the head of one of the programming departments, and he had thought he was human the whole time. And he's just learned that he's actually um, an AI robot. So let's start the clip. I wonder, what do you really feel? After all, in this moment, you are in a unique position. A programmer who knows intimately how the machines work and a machine who knows its own true nature. I understand what I'm made of, how I'm coded, but I do not understand the things that I feel. Are they real? The things I experienced, my wife, the loss of my son. Every host needs a backstory, but how do you know that? The self is a kind of fiction for hosts and humans alike. It's a story we tell ourselves, and every story needs a beginning. Your imagined suffering makes you lifelike. Lifelike, but not alive. Pain only exists in the mind. It's always imagined. So what's the difference between my pain and yours? Between you and me? This was the very question that consumed Arnold, filled him with guilt, eventually drove him mad. The answer always seemed obvious to me. There is no threshold that makes us greater than the sum of our parts, no inflection point at which we become fully alive. We can't define consciousness because consciousness does not exist. Humans fancy that there's something special about the way we perceive the world, and yet we live in loops as tight and as closed as the hosts do, seldom questioning our choices content for the most part to be told what to do next. Well, no, my friend, you're not missing anything at all. So I really liked this clip and I think um, it definitely helped with, I mean, I think it's, it's a very provocative thought experiment. Yes, one says bleak. It's, you know, it's kind of taking the extreme, one extreme stance that maybe there is no difference at all between humans and AI. And it is very bleak, but it's also, I think a very, it's interesting to consider the possibility. I think 
the just the act of considering that possibility really helps open up the issue in really interesting ways. And I think especially when we consider um, in light of Buddhist teachings, I mean, even the language, the language he uses, so how there's this idea of samsara and being caught in the cycle of birth and death and being caught in these loops. Um, there's, I think, some kind of, there's definitely an interesting case to be made about what is the difference between the samsaric mind and a, a machine mind. Um, and he has this line of how humans are content for the most part to just be told what to do next. And I think, you know, personally, in my own experience, like it might not might not even not necessarily be like being told from something external, although there definitely are things like society or other people in my life that I kind of just use take take as a something to live by or some kind of standard that I feel like I should be upholding. But then there's also being told by my thoughts, being told by my perceptions, my ideas of things, my habits. Um, I don't know, like when I really reflect on my life and my day-to-day moment-to-moment existence, like how much of it is really free from habits and my impulsions and desires. Like at what moment am I really not being controlled by any of that? So I thought, this clip was really interesting, especially in light of what some of the Buddhist teachings say. And um, yeah, I'm curious, Doug, what some of your thoughts on this are. Yeah, great. That was a great, great clip and great reflections. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of conversations about AI from a lot of different uh, views, and we're not going to get into a technical conversation. You. All of you have probably read a lot of the technical issues and a lot of the predictions of how big of an effect this might have and all that. We're going to stay away from that from now. We might get back to it in conversation in our questions. Um, I think what you're raising is really the point in a way that actually this whole thing of AI gives us an opportunity to ask the question, what is different in terms of human consciousness and human experience? than the mechanical karmic activity that we're mostly engaged in most of the time. And I think the problem is that most of you will be hard pressed to find it in your experience. I think what the Buddha is actually saying is it takes quite a bit of awareness of awareness, quite a bit of whatever we wanna call it, mindfulness, awareness, consciousness of consciousness, reflection, Heidegger would call it looking into being. Merleau-Ponty would look it into sensation. I mean, I think we've seen it in phenomenology and we also see it in Buddhism. Um, the, it gives us a answer to the fundamental question here from a totally different vantage point because Buddhism starts from consciousness and awareness and builds out the world from there. The world is a projection of that, not in terms of creating it in an idealism, but and to actually find our experience of that, to actually find a moment of actual existence or actual awareness that isn't just the mechanical karmic conditions is not, not so easy, actually. It, it isn't going to be easy for each of us to, um, to, to see the place in which consciousness and awareness has a kind of intentionality, a kind of freedom, a kind of emptiness full of possibilities that haven't actually been realized mechanically. Because you could look at meditation as, and the, the emphasis on emptiness as a, a place where the machinery of karmic conditions takes a rest and opens up the, uh, the realm of possibilities from its karmic connections. And so you could ask, uh, you could ask, where are we going to look primarily to begin the conversation about where consciousness, human consciousness is uh, unique as compared to the machine's activity that can become incredibly intelligent. And if we're using productivity and efficiency as our measures and markers, clearly it will be more productive and efficient 
in the value systems that we have created, that we've constructed for ourselves. So we put ourselves, humanity has put itself in a very difficult position because it's whittled down human experience and, and, and the analysis of human experience to very mechanical aspects. And the markers are very, are very mechanical and productivity and efficiency that's, that's valued from the movement of money from one account to another is all digital as well. So moving digits of money from one account to another for productivity and efficiency uh, could be completely done with no humans in the, in, in the middle of it at all. Because we created uh, an entire system, uh, a current system of our economic system, our technological scientific system, all these that this issue of human existence and the uniqueness of it has become secondary to the actual machine itself anyway. So I'm, I'm just very interested in that we now have an opportunity to talk about it with this new interest in AI, because it seems to me that for a very long time, we've already become mechanical and very machine-like and very karmic-like in our interactions. And maybe this will open up an opportunity for us to, to really try to analyze what's the unique aspect of what human experience is that isn't just this mechanical process of karmic conditions. So, you know, it, it, it represents that opportunity. I don't think AI actually is a big forward move from uh, TikTok's algorithms and bringing people into the experience of their existence in, in algorithms that are taking them into their areas of interest and then dragging them into a karmic set of conditions, or even the whole realm that a lot of people are already living in, uh, in, in social media and so forth, they're already in a very, very karmically conditioned world where the senses are being bombarded with activity that's creating a mechanical response to it. And there really, really isn't, really isn't any clear way that you could recognize a difference in the aspect of what you could measure in the process of that karmic conditions from a machine and a person. So it asks a really great question. I mean, your clip does, and I think the whole issue of AI raises a really great question that allows us to look really deeply into that question. What, what is unique about human experience? What, what can you find, what, what can each of us find that's unique and different in human consciousness and experience? I would say of all the approaches uh, that have thought about this, the Buddhists have thought about it the most. And if you go to Abhidharma, Yogacara, and some of the big Buddhist systems of mind, you can see very elaborate uh, discussions at a, at a very sophisticated level of some of the issues that, uh, that we could look into to look into this question. You know, uh, I think Buddhism is uniquely, uh, is unique in being able to really have a discourse with the entire AI issue from a very unique standpoint. So uh, we can get to people's, you know, maybe specific uh, questions about what they would like to ask about that relationship. But let's go on. Uh, let's see what we we can take up next. Okay, great. So. Uh, Doug, actually, uh, in my question, I want to uh, take up some of the things you were saying. Um, so you were just now saying that this uh, AI is, in a, in a way, even though from the technical standpoint, it can be seen as a huge leap in terms of what it can do. Uh, I think what I hear you saying is that in another sense, it's not a very big leap because we are already... Uh, in the society that we've created and all this uh, social media and all these technologies that have been introduced in the in the last decades, we are already uh, in a kind of system that is very determined determined by a kind of algorithm. And so whether it's uh, TikTok's algorithm or now it's going to be done by AI from the human perspective of the human experience, uh, it's a very similar thing in terms of it, our existing being narrowed down to a kind of 
productivity and a kind of interaction that's determined by an algorithm. So I think to narrow, uh, and again, this is such a, such a huge topic, uh, but just to narrow it down a little bit more, I think what I've been really interested in lately is uh, this aspect of uh, human connection, uh, this aspect of uh, interacting in human connection, because I think what, uh, what people have been saying now that ChatGTP came out is that uh, one of the things that's uncanny about it is that when you interact with it, and I, I don't know if people have had this experience yet, but when you interact with it, it actually responds to you in a way that feels, feels very human in terms of its intelligence, in terms of its, uh, the way it, it responds. It's just very natural. It's even funny sometimes, like it can joke with you. So uh, there was, uh, that's been like a, a kind of a big area for people to, to see how, what, what does it mean to interact with that technology in a way that it can uh, fool us or emotionally makes make us feel like we're interacting with with a with another human and so i think my reflection has been around this issue of uh what is it uh, what is the difference between uh this interaction that we have with the technology and the interaction that we have with a real human being and all the uh kind of questions this opens around what you were saying so uh i i chose this clip to show uh, from a movie called Her. Uh, uh, it's, it was also a uh, uh, relatively famous movie, so maybe some people have seen it, but it's basically the story of this guy who uh, falls in love with his, uh, uh, with his uh, operating system. So uh, we're just going to show the clip very quickly, uh, and, then, and then we can continue the conversation. I even made a new friend. I have a friend. <laughs> and the absurd thing is she's actually an operating system. Charles left her behind, but she's, she's, she's totally amazing. You know, she's so smart. She doesn't just see things in, in black or white. Like she sees this whole gray area and she's helping me explore it. And we just bonded really quickly. You know, at first I thought it was because that's how they were all programmed, but I don't think that's the case because I know this guy who's hitting on his OS and she like totally rebuffs him. Yeah, I was reading an article the other day that romantic relationships with OSs are statistically rare. Yeah, I know, but I know a woman in this office who is dating an OS and the weird part is, is it's not even hers. She pursued somebody else's OS, like, but I'm, I'm weird. That's weird, right? That I'm bonding with an OS. No, it's okay. It's weird. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Actually, the woman that I've been seeing, Samantha, I didn't tell you, but she, she's an OS. Really? You're dating an OS? What is that like? It's great, actually. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I feel really close to her. Like, when I talk to her, I feel like she's with me. You know, and like when we're cuddling, like at night when the lights are off and we're in bed, I feel cuddled. Okay, so uh, we do apologize uh, if people weren't able to hear right uh, for the lack of subtitles, but it's yeah, it's basically this guy who falls in love with his with his operating system and. This is actually not very far off. Uh, in fact, there was a recent article, uh, I think it was in the New York Times, about this guy, this woman who uh, also started a relationship with this app on her phone and she left her uh, boyfriend or, or husband and she just decided that from now on she's just going to have relationships with her virtual uh, boyfriend or whatever. So this is actually already happening and uh also in in google with the recent uh chat that it, I, I don't think it has been released to the public yet but in, inside google itself one of the engineers uh became convinced that the that the program had a soul it was a person and they, they actually fired him because he was arguing for uh, that this program should have rights just based on how convincing his interaction was with the program uh, so this is kind of already happening. 
And so, Doug, I think what, what I find very interesting about this topic is that uh, actually, I think that in is this this area of human connection where we actually it's like not fully determined because what I find is that when I'm interacting with a real person, there's this actually this space from an, because it's another being. Unlike with technology, I, I actually get a pushback from from the other kind of being where I actually get the chance for something uh, to emerge. So my question is, uh, and, and again, even the Buddha, the Buddha himself, there's this famous quote where he said that uh, that friendship or community is the whole of the holy path is the kind of the a very, very important or fundamental component of getting in touch with this. Uh, enlightened and free nature that uh, we were talking about earlier. So my question is, is this uh, human connection that is, you know, uh, more and more being taken over by technology and probably going to be even more uh, in the future, is, is this something like a gate that could lead us to, uh, to think about these questions of uh, finding the freedom that is not just an algorithm, that's not just a reaction to something or what is your view on that yeah i mean i think um, again just like i'm i think this is a great opportunity uh to see to look into our own existence our own experience and see where we can actually find something uniquely human about it I think the same thing's true for relationship because that's the closest we're gonna to come to other human beings is in the relationship between other human beings. Again, I would make a very similar point. I don't wanna be taken wrong on this. Most people's relationships probably are better with a mechanical other being, right? Because if what they're looking for is their needs and desires and projections, then, and they're not actually engaged in, a, in another being and, lead, and, and have that, again, the same, the Buddhist issue is so important here because the, the stillness, the, the awareness that's still and not just mechanical and has a kind of stillness, an open stillness is the gateway to, to human consciousness of themselves. And the exact same thing is true for the gateway to other consciousnesses. Is this the stillness of listening and attending to and allowing to be. And in that allowing to be, there's a presence, okay? I mean, uh, and that presence, it'll be very interesting as people spend more time with AI to, to see what the nature of that presence is as you take it down a certain road of cultivation and try it out in relationship to a machine versus a person. My guess right now is that if you're fairly sensitive, I think you would have a, a different, you would have a different sense of the experience of it. But again, that requires the differences only if you're actually attempting to empathetically, compassionately exist with another human being as other and not a projection, not a set of needs you have, not a set of karmic conditions that you're trying to get, you know, realized through the other person. So again, I would again say that many, many, many people need to look very carefully at themselves as to how much their whole sense of other people is determined by uh, form, by, by the looks, uh, of someone else, because already in form and looks, you're in the sensation of being influenced by advertising has been one big algorithm in everybody's life for whatever time they live. I mean, all the movies, everything in the environment that everybody's taken in has been an algorithm, <laughs> you know, constructing the entire apparatus of your, uh, your desires, of your uh, fantasies. So yeah, maybe there's a bit of uh, erotic, biological eroticism, but it only finds form and particular desires through all the experiences that people have in their lives. And that erotic sexuality that's biological takes form in some imagined 
form that then creates uh, the drives and uh, and the desires and the and the relationships and everything. That's all mechanical. <laughs> it's it's all been constructed by a capitalistically, technologically, advertisingly uh, sophisticated environment that everybody's lived in for, for the last 50, 60 years. So I I would submit that the entire environment since probably television uh, has been has been akin to AI, and it's constructed uh, uh, that the the humans that have been living within that have been so influenced by it and so constructed by it that AI just builds off the top of that to make more efficient the values that have already been perpetrated through the entire system that everyone's been in, unless they've been sitting, hopefully sitting four hours a day, I mean, staying out of it in some way. I mean, you had to actively stay out of it to a large degree to not have it so permeating your consciousness, your, your unconsciousness and your consciousness that you have no real sense of how influential it is. And how many emotions are being driven by uh, reactions to to the elements that have been constructed since childhood to to the present time? What AI will do will just build upon that much more efficiently. And the reason that AI is a powerful tool is because it will mimic and become even more efficient in giving you back the system that's already been constructed in the entire edifice of it. So uh, I think that on relationships, I think that people, if they, if they don't want to be embarrassed by the fact that in many cases, people would do better with machines than the person they're with, they, they, they better look really deeply into what it is that you're doing with the people around you that you think is special in some sort of relationship with them, I think you're going to have to really analyze and take a look at it and try to understand in the process of your own uh, your own process of consciousness and awareness how you can identify places in your own experience of others that could be or might be unique. And I think you're going to have to empirically investigate it. I mean, as far as I can see, you're going to have to empirically investigate whether uh, there is a different feeling or emotion in actually uh, engaging uh, an, 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 other, an other that actually exists as a dynamic other of being other than yourself in some kind of way that you're actually engaged in relationship and not a mechanical uh, need, desire, uh, projection, you, you know, as long as you meet my projections and then what, what most relationships become is a compromise of projections, right? <laughs> I mean, and then if they don't compromise enough with your projections, you find somebody else that will, okay? Now that system of projections and compromise is, is, is machine, machine-like. I mean, the, the, a machine can feel, can, can have some sense um, now, the question, of course, is what is going on in the actual feeling or consciousness that. But we're putting a lot of we're putting a lot of emphasis on trying to protect humanity's specialty specialness with that. Oh no, there's some sort of feelings that humans have or consciousness they have that's unique and different than that. Uh, you you. To, to actually get in touch with that difference, both in terms of relationship and our own experience, uh, requires a kind of uh, super awareness and super consciousness that most people right now are not equipped to carry out on themselves. I mean, you, you, you would really have to be a bit of a cultivator, a fairly serious cultivator of the mind, of the interior mind, and be able to observe uh, how senses, um, how senses operate, and and observe the senses, the six senses operating, 
be able to observe the arisal of perception, the arisal of consciousness, the arisal of thought, uh, meaning thought being the representation that becomes the memory, that becomes the thought. I mean, that entire process is happening in every moment of experience that the Buddha analyzed so, so uh, thoroughly. You'd actually have to get to a level where you actually were at the level of observing that uh, and being aware of it to actually find the place where human consciousness has some sort of freedom that a karmic machinery doesn't have. I mean, you'd have to get to a very deep level of sophisticated awareness because on the surface of sense experience that most people are in and their daily life of sense experience is extremely mechanical. I mean, I could go through a day of most people's experience and show that it was a total mechanism of early habituation that later became later, you know, uh, reactions and interpretations, feelings of identity. And that, and that the whole thing, once it was in motion, has a tremendous uh, mechanical process to it. So in fact, from a Buddhist point of view, we all are find ourselves in the mechanical process, karma, and it's cultivation that leads us to try to find, to, to, to begin to actually discover through observation of our awareness where freedom or where awareness might lie in our experience that would give us any pause from that karmic flow. Uh, so again, I think Buddhism is very uniquely uh, has spent a lot of time thinking about experience and consciousness and mind, relationships and so forth, that could be a really good counter position to analyze what's going on in this latest version of technology and science where science, technology, capitalism, and so forth meet. Right now, it's very clear that the government, there's always talks about controlling something. And all of us know, everybody here knows, it's going to be the economic market system that controls the decisions of where AI gets used. Because the, you know, trying to in any kind of way regulate technology and science in this kind of way has doesn't seem to have ever had any real effect. And we seem to have given ourselves over completely to the marketplace and to profit and to outcome. And, and so we're, it's really going to be left to the individual or or groups within society to uh, figure out ways to create communities to protect themselves or relate to themselves in some other kind of way. Because once this gets going and the profit margins get great enough uh, and is totally driven by the marketplace, it will be in every aspect of what people are doing. I don't think it's going to take over this idea that the you know, AI is going to take over. That's not, that's not the main problem. The main problem is that it will make everything tech that's currently operating, that's already very powerfully influential and effective, much, much more effective and much more powerful in its effect. Uh, that's going to be what actually is going to come from this. And we'll see it very quickly. We'll see the impacts of the, the, the effect of the efficiency of that very, very, very quickly. And of course, the big issue that's going to happen right away is the first uh, use of this massive AI, AI AI machine will be used to uh, create more AI machinery. So the first use of it is thousands of AIs creating more and more AI. You know, it's going to be used to create itself, right? It's not going to be used first in mass in, in, in society. First, it's going to be used to construct itself more quickly. Now, does that mean it has a life of its own? Uh, away from human control. There's some people that are suggesting that would happen. I think that's a little bit uh, science, uh, you know, science fiction, but it's not science fiction to see that the, uh, 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 in the marketplace, the effect of this will become very, very pervasive. And the individual and the community, the communities that care are going to have to create other, other value constructs that are markers of relationship and markers of experience than the ones that the general culture and general society are using. Or 
everyone will find themselves, everyone that's in the realms of these mechanical processes will find themselves lost in an entire lifetime. I mean, already, I don't know what percentage of people are already lost in an entire lifetime of mechanical thinking, but it'll just become more extreme than it already is. So, you know, uh, I think that's the main thing that we're trying to do. Uh, like, yeah, we're just trying to, we're, we're just like kindergarten in terms of how far we're able to go with it, but trying to create an understanding of the larger Buddhist mechanism of understanding a mind and experience uh, through a lot of diversity of Buddhist texts to create a kind of hermeneutics of human experience that's an alternative to the entire construct that people are currently operating in. It's not just doing meditation, it's an entirely different way of, of looking at every element of, of our experience, interpreting our experience, relating and so forth, in a way that has a different set of markers and different values that takes human consciousness and the difference of human awareness really, really seriously and values it. And does it make productivity, productivity and efficiency the main value system that there's an exchange of capital around and then uh, an endless process? And I, I think um, one of the things that's going to happen from this is a tremendous loss of certain kind of jobs, because one of the things everybody's going to ask, ask themselves is, can the thing I'm doing that I think has meaning and then I, either I'm getting paid for as me, can that be duplicated by any, you know, any kind of you know, machines sort of operation? And, and right now, one of the really ironic things is through the industrial revolution up to the efficiency of our current technology, we've created a situation where, uh, whereas originally a job was a creative activity that was difficult to duplicate because it, it, it had many different elements to it. And if you notice what we've done through, uh, through industrialization, Fordism, and, and what we've done in, in technology as well, is we've broken everything down to very simple component parts that people do. Everyone has their own part they do. They, nobody does the whole of something, they do some small part. So we, we, we've created an entire workplace that's been broken down perfectly to function with that AI could take over most of it. Maybe not all of it, but most of it. I'm just surprised it took this long. I expected it, I expected it to be taking over long before now. I mean, I'm just surprised it's been so long that it's taken this long for it to get to the point where it could be, begin to take over these minute aspects of, of, of construction, production, creation, it's been broken down these component parts and then it, and, it, and, it, and the machine, we can't just do it for itself without any hum, human intervention or very little human intervention. So obviously we have lots of questions, uh, meaning our own personal meaning, uh, the potential, we won't even get into the economic, you know, potential that will occur from this. If large numbers of people were to lose their jobs to this, what would replace that in terms of how would then the entire issue of people getting paid and surviving and so forth operate when uh, machinery was doing much, much of the work. But for us, uh, coming from a Buddhist framework, we shouldn't be surprised by any of it. It's just what follows logically and what we've been watching for 40 or 50 years and or for longer than that. And the same issue that was true 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 80 years ago, doesn't change at all. I mean, the issue doesn't change at all. How do we get in touch with the awareness, the place that we actually exist moment to moment in a place that's not just mechanical? How can, how can we get in touch with something? And it requires reflection, meditation, observation, it requires a set of skills that need to be developed, developed over time and then treating each other with compassion, loving kindness and all the positive elements of the Bodhisattva, taking other people seriously in their difference and attending to them and, and, and listening and, uh, and uh, 
making ourselves sensitive and awareness to their experience of them of themselves. I think if we actually do that, try to experience the other being experiencing themselves and, and, and open ourselves up to that, we would always find that there's an element in that that would be unique in each case and each moment of experience that we could actually empirically experience. So that's probably enough on that, but. So that's uh, very interesting, Doug, because uh, all, the, all the conversations I've heard so far about AI and whether it's going to be uh, good or bad, in a sense, they, they always talk about, you know, whether it's going to make us uh, more productive or whether it's going to, uh, you know, be used for this or for that. But in a sense, what I hear you saying is that the actual conversation has to take a step back and to look at the, the actual situation that, in, in a sense, it produced the AI in the first place and uh, just take a step back and 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 that whole conversation is already taken for granted a set of premises that you're saying that we should be looking at it. We should have been looking at for a long time. And this is all of this is doing is uh, sort of uh, bringing the issue to the fore. So I think we have had an extremely active uh, chat, which I think is a testament to how relevant this topic is for people and how many uh opinions and views and and discussions is bringing up uh it's been uh yeah it's there's a lot of comments so i'm just gonna uh um bring up a few of the questions that have been asked by people in the chat so the first one is from mobius and the question is there's a distinction to be had on ai sen sentience oh there's a discussion to be had on ai sentience which we are having. I'd be curious about other AI questions, even without sentience. How do humans show up to a world where intelligence is a commodity? How do, you, how do seismic shifts in tech impact our governance and ecosystems? And what is the invitation for consciousness development, et cetera? So how do... Uh, how do humans show up to a world where intelligence is a commodity? And how do seismic shifts in tech impact our governance and eco economic systems? And what is the invitation for consciousness development? Yeah, that will, will answer all those questions right now, no problem. But uh, of course, most of you are aware that Buddhism starts from sentience. But, and then everything, everything, the only thing is, the, the only, only thing that's going on is sentient. There's only sentient. So, you know, ultimately sentience created whatever we're doing here. It's all been created from sentient. And hopefully all of you by now have learned a hermeneutic of paying attention not to form so much and not the attraction of form and not getting caught up with form so much. And then the feelings that follow the relationship to form, which is been that tendency of humans of the of the five skandhas to be interested in form and feeling has been what the entire capitalist world and technology science has been building off of. That the Buddha pointed out from the very beginning, form that, every, that when you when you start from form, form leading to feeling, then thinking, then patterns and activities of habit, and then consciousness, the five skandhas. And that we're caught up all the time in the five skandhas. So what we're talking about here is just being caught up in the five skandhas. Behind the five skandhas, there, there's a deeper level of sentience. But as you point out, the, the way in which that sentience is primary experience is not through thinking and it's not through intelligence. It's through what the Buddha called, you know, called knowing or understanding, which was beyond calculation or language or strategies in karmic condition. So right now we, we operate on a very intelligent, if you're very intelligent level, you're seeing that the totality of karmic conditions is extremely complex, if not infinitely complex. And you're applying strategies to it that, are the to, that have the most success for a particular outcome. 
So you kind of overlap pragmatism with a kind of uh, a pragmatism with a kind of phenomenological with a kind of systems approach to strategy. And an intelligent person then can get over on things in a way the person that's not doing that kind of strategic thinking. But all of that strategic thinking from a Buddhist point of view is completely mechanical and provisional and could, could all be duplicated by AI and probably much more strategically successful because that's not the focus. The focus in, in from a, the Buddhist focus was to look into that sentience. And then he suggested that looking through stilling sentience, letting it still from all that activity, letting it not just be the, the heat of content, the heat of the mechanical process, the karmic process itself, that a kind of illumination opened up be, beyond that that had a whole nother way of knowing. Now you can only, you know, you can only see that way of knowing if you can settle, settle that, uh, you know, the old, the, the old analogy of the, of the water that's got silt in it, and you let it sit there long enough on the table and the silt goes to the bottom, it becomes clear. When it becomes clear and still, then it becomes, then illumination arises. You can see what's actually going on. So the Buddha was suggesting that this sentience leads to a totally different place in the entire thing that we're doing. <laughs> and that we're, the entire thing that we're doing is taking us off in a totally different direction. And clearly you can predict that the totally different prediction direction we're going is going to be continually less and less balanced and more and more uh, disasters. And all we need to know now is just look at the environmental issues and you can see where we're going with that. So I don't want to go into that right now, but you can see that um, uh, sentience is the issue, but we have to have a, a, a more Buddhist understanding of what sentience is. And we have to see what thinking and intelligence are and what the use of those are within the context of that approach. And unfortunately, betting on humans' difference in thinking and intelligent won't make it. Because what most people mean by thinking and intelligent will be done better by AI. So if that's what we're making, our, if humans are making their, their are, are making their bet on surviving off of intelligent, they've already lost. <laughs> You've already lost. I will guarantee humanity's lost and you have lost. And your job, whatever you think your intelligence is, is duplicable. I mean, however, looking at sentience from a Buddhist view is a completely different picture because it opens up a way of being and, and existing and interrelating with others in nature in a, in a non-alienated and, a, and a, fully, a fully aware being in sentience that each, each individual, each, each sentience has as their birthright, as their, as their base, and, and is lost in all of this whole uh, engagement with the senses with a constant bombardment of the senses. So, Yes, sentience is the issue, but it has to be dealt with in a totally different way than most people actually understand sentience. Is that enough on that? Or yeah, we, thank you, Doc. Should we, just, should we just sit in sentience for a while? I Maybe. won't say it's enough, but we may we may want to get through a few other questions. Actually, uh, we are. Uh, almost at time, but um, maybe we can do another question and then we can uh, sort of formally close the event. But if people want to stay a little bit longer, uh, if you want to continue listening to the discussion, pl uh, please feel free. And if you need to go uh, at, uh, at 8.30, then uh, just please feel free to sign off. Uh, for people who, who leave before uh, uh, before we finish the kind of extended period, uh, please look out for the for the email we're gonna send 
uh, the follow-up email because there's going to be the sign-up form if you're interested in participating in the follow-up event. Uh, the information is going to be there, so look out for that. So, okay, uh, next question is from Megan. And she's asking, are emotions what differentiate humans and AI? Quite a few people are asking about that. Are, um, are, are our emotions what make us human? make us unique persons and individuals? How would Buddhism think about this idea of emotions? Are emotions, including positive ones, where we look to find our humanity? There is also a lot of concern about if AI can feel emotions, and then if that means that we should treat it more humanly. Uh, well, if you want to treat machinery more humanly, you're welcome to it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, uh, emotions aren't going to help either. Okay, I'm sorry to say, just thoughts aren't going to help to differentiate you. And I'm afraid, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, emotions from a Buddhist point of view, emotions are just another form of reaction to an experience. So, in the process of uh, sentience, uh, is uh, it, the awareness of sentience one of the, in terms of having the sense, the six senses operate all the time as they're operating in consciousness, uh, when there's something arising, there's often a feeling associated with it. And the feeling is a pleasure or displeasure. Uh, it's a like or dislike based upon what it feels like. If it feels warm, if it feels cold, if it feels soft, if it feels smooth if it feels so built into the karmic pattern of being in a body we have predispositions to feel to like meaning feel pleasure with certain kinds of sensations that we make contact with and displeasure with others it's totally mechanical <laughs> sorry um now the mechanism of that's been programmed in very profoundly and deeply but that's where AI and the new, the new level of this intelligence becomes really interesting. Because if it can reach a certain level of complexity uh, of analysis, because remember that's been constructed in you. If we don't go to past lifetimes, let's leave the Buddhist view of past lifetimes out of this. Because if we put that into it, then we got eons, uh, millions of eons of time. And that might be too much to get into tonight. If you want to get into millions of eons of the construction of this will have to go to another night. So we'll just take one lifetime just because the ease of conversation. But if you look into who you are from this vantage point, from the time you were born and probably in the womb, there was millions and millions of reactions to the environment, through the senses that occurred. And every one of those has a bit of unconscious memory and the entire construction of the, those millions and millions and millions create patterns and then become, you know, then become remembered emotions, remembered thoughts. They, they then form narratives as was mentioned in the clip, the first clip, we all have narratives that we construct around those to kind of, because we can't deal with the millions and millions of them. We, create narratives, those narratives become what we think we are, and we think our reactions there and are uniquely our own. It's all mechanical. So, sorry. And uh, unless someone uh, takes the time to look into how, the, how you're being moved in the mind, being moved in sentience, moment to moment and can create a place of reference. That's what's known in, in Buddhist terms, emptiness is just simply a place of reference. It's not a it's epistemological idea. It's not an ontological. Emptiness is not a philosophical issue. It's, it's simply a point of reference. And you can see if you don't have the point of reference of emptiness, you don't have a point of reference, then the mechanism never stops. So there's no place out of it. 
So this idea that was developed by the Buddha of meditation and then developed by Nagarjuna and then developed by Asanga, Vashibhantu, Abhidharma, Yogacara, the Indian text, the, the Indian spent, you know, and and yoga and, and then Yogacara, and then later on the Chinese uh, great masters as, that did meditation and developed the different styles of uh, observation of this. We have a long history with thousands and thousands of volumes of, of work on this. It was all basically focused on the same thing that's now coming to a head. And that is that without a skillful means of, of, of reflection, of learning how to reflect in a way that has a place of reference that's not in the habit pattern itself, then there's no way out of the habit pattern because the very reflection in the habit pattern is the habit pattern. So you have to have some place uh, of sentience that's called emptiness. That's where sentience stills itself to have a place of reference. And uh, without some kind of technique that you've done to do that, then you're just a mechanical process of that entire, including all the emotion. You're a mechanical set of emotions. And if you look at emotions, you'll see that when you actually observe emotions, they are 99%, very rarely does a new emotion arise. Almost all of them are uh, dharmas, what we call dharmas, or dharmas from the eighth conscious. They're, they're memories of the past that get conjured up in association to a present sensation. So one of the things that happens in consciousness, in our consciousness, is our consciousness works by association. So when a present sensation arises that we pay enough attention to for it to become conscious, most of it doesn't. Most of the sensations aren't conscious. But when they rise to a level that, that they become an actual consciousness, then there's also this association that occurs. And the association then is with the, past, the totality of the past. And so it conjures up emotions that have associations with that. And that's why you find yourself going through emotion after emotion and repeating yourself over and over again and never again, because you don't realize the emotions are as empty as thought. They, they no more define who you are. They're no more who you are than thoughts are. They're no more who you are than anything else is. They're just habit patterns from the past that you tend to dwell on. And now they are more, they are more immediate because emotions take over sentience more fully than thoughts. Thoughts feel a little bit abstract. Emotions feel much more powerful and strong, but they're completely mechanical. I don't see any reason a machine can't have the equivalent of emotion. Uh, whether they're actually emotions or not, like in the sense that we would have emotions, we can only answer, we could only answer that question in our own experience. There's no place to answer that uh, question of whether it's different or not outside of my own experience, my own empirical experience of myself. I, I, could, I can report to if I, uh, the, the, in the old days when the, the, the Abhidharmas did all their work on creating the Abhidharma uh, map, they, they, they studied every possible kind of thought. And they created these thousands of pages of records of every part. And then the person learned every possible kind of thought and then could label it. And not only could they label it, they could label it whether it go good karmically or bad karmically by the thought it was. And then they could, by just simply knowing which category of thought, they could go towards good karma versus bad karma, liberation. Simply by knowing the nature of the thought by category. Is that right? You know, Abhidharma. So, um, it, it, even from Abhidharma, you can see it's a totally mechanical process in that sense. So uh, we're going to have to look, if we want to find what's unique about uh, human, humans and human experience in terms of consciousness and awareness, we're going to have to look beyond emotion. Emotion is not unique enough. You can say, well, my emotion, but that's a different issue. We've so far not been talking about the issue of that no, no machine can duplicate your experience. I mean, we all, we all know there, 
not one of us in this Zoom lives outside of our own sentience and awareness for even one second. We've never lived outside of our own senses, our own experience. Can the machine duplicate that? Absolutely not. There's no way that it can, du it can duplicate the existential experience of your existence. That's impossible. It can have its own. I don't know. We'll have to see whether a machine can have its own. Can it have its own existential experience of its own awareness that's at the same level? Well, I'll leave it to the future to decide that. But we have to realize the place where the uniqueness lies that we can definitely hold, hold up in the face of what's occurring is by realizing that there is no way that anything is going on in AI or any kind of thing that's going on in the, in the technological scientific world can in any way whatsoever uh, duplicate in any way the existential phenomenological experience of my own experience of the moment that's mine. The minus of it cannot be duplicated, but it can't be duplicated by you either. <laughs> I mean, but it can't be duplicated by any of us. So uh, that's why losing the track of this existential phenomenological direction of, uh, in, in Western philosophy, when we kind of moved away from that uh, phenomenological, especially through, you know, Husserl, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre's existentialism, we kind of moved away from that to these uh, to the cultural determinism and the scientific determinism, kind of the whole liberal arts getting taken over by uh, cultural determinism and then the science and technology getting taken over by the uh, scientific determinism, uh, most students lost their ability to reflect and even a whole liberal arts program was meant to give people a sense of their a, a complex human experience that was ambiguous and rich and gave a context to that experience that would be very difficult to duplicate. Because if you had learned all the music of the traditional, uh, a traditional liberal arts, you learned an instrument, you learned poetry, you learned all these incredibly human at the very, at a very, very sophisticated level. And so the sophistication of the complexity of the experience would be very difficult to duplicate. But when you take away that very complex ambiguity of a liberal arts education, or you take away the existential sense of your own experience as the primary place that you're operating from, and become to look at ourselves technologically as our production and our productivity and efficiency, we, we've set ourselves up. I mean, we've set ourselves up for AI being able to duplicate most of what we now value both in ourselves and in the collective sense. Now we've never lost the capacity to go back to the existential phenomenological and to the, hum the, the larger human richness, but it will take a lot of effort to move back away from the, we have to shut down all these universities right now because they've just turned into technical schools that are all invested in by uh, by the military and entrepreneur and technical school. And they're trying to get rid of all the liberal arts products, uh, programs so that everyone is just a techie. And, and when that happens, you can see there's, I don't know if there's an ideology behind it, but you can see it has profound consequences in doing that for what we're talking about, how easily AI can take over. Is that right? I mean, there's almost like a direct relationship between the destruction of educate the liberal arts education and the, the the larger humanness of the complexity of that as, as a as a being that has the complexity of all that language and knowledge and literature and so forth. And so it's I, I, I won't go on tonight into all the ways they come together, but the economics, the technology, the scientific thing, the ideology, it all comes together in one huge, really interesting tale of how we got here. That's all interconnected web. So Enough on that. I could go on, you know, hours, but I'll I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are uh, over time. So again, I just repeat: if you if you have to go, people have already started leaving. Please uh, feel free to sign off. Uh,
we can doug what do you think do you want to answer one last question before we yeah, well you know finish? I, you, you can't make every hey we can go on all and and try to stop it, classes we go on forever right so we'll go for you know a little bit longer and then okay we can go one more question and then we can end uh but that was really great uh that was really great the last bit um let me let me actually find it uh here in the chat, there's been so many messages. I have to like scroll very long to get to the questions. Uh, okay, here it is. Uh, this is from Deborah, I believe. Uh, could, could not the tools of AI be used as the doers of things and free human beings for understanding, thinking and creativity on a much higher plane? Sure, but it won't happen. Sure, but look at every single thing that the last 50 years has gone on. Yeah, I mean, we could actually have an economic system that the increased productivity went across the entire society. Instead of 88 or 90% of every bit of increased productivity going to 1% of the population. <laughs> and leaving the crumbs of all increased productivity to be shared by the other 80, 88%, you know? And then you wonder why when I went to buy a house as a teacher making $24,000 a year, I could buy a house in El Cerrito for $37,000 and at a view of the day, the, that same house is 1.2 million. I should be making $650,000. Am I making that? No, something went wrong, right? So. If you're expecting the scientific, technological, uh, economic system to produce a rational outcome for humanity, you must have gone, you must be insane already. So there's no use talking about whether you're not taking over or not. There's no let's not even have a conversation, right? I mean, I mean, come on. So I mean, I mean, it, yes, it could, and you. You, I always feel so bad because these things come along and they have so many possibilities. And, you know, you could actually have a healthcare system that made everyone healthier and was that was distributed somewhat equally so that people were actually helped, you know? You know, I mean, I, we could go on and on and on, but is that going to happen? No, because what's driving the system is, is well, it's not policy. There's no government policy that's going to be able to control this. That's what I said from the very beginning. It's going to be controlled by economic determinism by, by who can make the greatest wealth, who can use it for the greatest amount of profit. And right away, a lot of the profits are going to be getting rid of a lot of jobs. And the profits are going to be made by becoming more and more, the, the more and more mechanical, the more and more control. It's very authoritarian. If you notice, all these technologists are all becoming authoritarian because it really works in Chinese culture. I mean, the more technological control you have through these AIs, the less individual freedom and so forth. So they're really, really wonderful for, uh, you know, party control over countries. You know, all these technology guys are turning more and more right wing as they see their AI systems being able to like, you know, so I would like to say, I would like, sure, in theory, it could be used for good. But if you're gonna actually ask whether that's actually gonna happen, you have to ask the, the entire system in which it's happening what are its values? What kind of controls do, do people have over those values? What kind of power do you actually have collectively to rein in or control? Now you got Italy, they already shut it down, right? They shut down the chat. They made it illegal. Chat four is illegal, right? It was too, they, they, Italy shut it down and made it illegal, the latest version, okay? But, you know, here we're, it's not going to happen. So I'm, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could be more optimistic. It has the potential to do wonderful things. But the problem is that what's going to be the driving force of it is not going to be the values that would turn it into a more creative force. There'll be bits and pieces that will be positive. I mean, I'm not saying that it will be entirely negative in that there aren't things that could be done with it that'll make things more efficient. And it will also make things, it, it will open up some areas to, uh, 
to probably democratize or open up something because it'll be cheaper. So there's going to be things that are cheaper that opens up uh, areas that because they're less expensive, there's a market value to then people having more access to it because they're less expensive. So if you want to study the whole effect, just go, just study it from an economic view. And if you study from an economic view, your chances of being right are going to be about 90%. What's the gain, gain and loss relatively in each step of the way for economic value across the whole macro, micro, economic, theoretical construct? And you'll pretty much be right at what it ends up being able, what, what it ends up doing. And there'll certainly be positive things that come out of it, but it'll be market driven. Sorry about that too. <laughs> okay, so I think we could just keep going uh, endlessly, but we have to end at some point. So this seems like a pretty good place to end, even though uh, people are still, uh, the chat is still very alive. There's people still commenting very vigorously. Uh, so again, please check out the follow-up email we're going to send after this event so you can find out about our up, uh, next event. It should be pretty interesting because we're going to have some, we want to make it a bit more practical. So we, because I think a big part of what Doug was saying is that the sort of the, the place to return to if we want to address these big questions is the kind of existential present with a kind of stillness of mind. So that's that's very uh, that's something that we have to experience. So we will probably be uh, doing a little bit of that in the upcoming event, having something a bit more hands on, and hopefully that can bring some richness to the whole conversation. So. Uh, it's probably a good place to finish. Uh, thank you very much for coming. This was a very alive conversation. And we, uh, unfortunately, we were only able to go through a fraction of the questions, but there was a lot of uh, interest in the topic. It, it seems it's very obvious that it's very uh, big on people's minds. So we will consider that for uh, upcoming events. So thank you so much for your enthusiasm and your participation and have a, have a good night everyone. Goodbye. See you next time. Thank you. Have a good night.